Hua Guan, everybody. Welcome to the Dis Afimi History Podcast, where we'll be speaking about history and as well family history and how history relates in terms of Caribbean people um, for the present as well as in the past and how in the past what that does and brings forth for what we are going through at present and what we can learn from our history, from our family, and take that moving forward. So I do hope you enjoy the podcast. And if you like it, please ensure to subscribe, like, and review. Thank you. In today's episode, I will be speaking with Dudley McLean II in regards to an article he wrote in the Jamaican Observer called Jamaica's Best Kept Secret, Blacks Own Slaved which was published on December the 29th, 2019. So let's have a listen. Thank you for coming on to the podcast. And um, I just wanted to know if you can just, before we start, if you can tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Well, my name is Dudley McLean. I was born in Mandeville, parish of Manchester, Jamaica. My educational formation began at Newbridge, traditionally called Miss Bailey School. Then I went on to the Catholic College, Church Teachers College, and Codrington College in Barbados, which is affiliated to the University of the West Indies. I love writing, and I've written numerous letters and articles that have been published in our national newspapers, that is The Gleaner and The Jamaica Observer. And since March last year, 2020, I began blogging and I've gone over to this date over 100 or so blog posts. Um, those can be found at it's the hammer at wordpress.com. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'll make sure that those are in the show notes so people can be able to browse them as well. And so we'll start because. Um, the reason in terms of, you know, you're, you wrote this article in the Jamaican Observer, which really touched me. And it was a question that came up in my own family research that I came across. And of course, a very different narrative than what I grew up knowing about this particular period in slavery. And what propelled you to bring this topic public? Well, first of all, um, I did my DNA test in 2019. And when the results came, I discovered that I carried nine ethnicities, um, which included European, African, uh, some um, Asian, all sorts of mix up. So I said, what is this, you know? And, um, and secondly, I also came from a family background where my late mother was like the center of the family. She knew everybody. Everybody would come and look for her. She would tell me family stories. I was curious because um, she's a Hilton descent, for example. And uh, there was um, much effort put out to secure the Hilton surname. So for example, her line, the last male to carry the Hilton surname was her uncle. So her mother deliberately named her Hilton. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. And um, I had a brother that followed after me after birth. He died in infancy. He um, was never given uh, my father's surname. He was given Hilton. <laughs> mm. uh, so there was this curiosity. Why would you want to keep this white man's surname, as one would say? Yeah. And then on my father's side my grandmother um, changed my father's name completely Mm -hmm. well she had four children one was living with her elder sister in Kingston so that sister kept the original name but the other two um, the others their names are changed so my father was already with Cliff Skinner and he became Dudley McLean okay right and when my father died, um, I discovered that grandma had also changed his date of birth. But that's another story <laughs> to deal with. But um, just to say that when I was eight years old, uh, my father told me about the name change. So there was always that curiosity to find out about the Skinners, you know, who am I really, and so forth. Yes. Now, when I did the DNA tests, 
and trying to put the family tree together, then you know uh, you discover new names, new families, everything. And I found, for example, that I there's this family when I wrote to them, I thought they were Jamaicans. I discovered they were in Australia, and uh, they gave me two possible connections because. The gentleman who handled the family tree account, I was actually matching his wife and the wife's mother and brother. So that was able to um, zoom, we would say zoom in on maybe where the line was coming from. And he gave me two possible names. The first name I eliminated because when that person came to Jamaica, my grandmother was already married and had her children. And the second name was Duck and Feel, and I said, Duck and Feel. So I started to research and, you know, um, for, for the descendants in Australia, there were uh, descendants of Christine Duck and Feel, which was Robert Duck and Feel's um, sister. Now, Robert Duck and Feel owned the Sugar Estate in St. Thomas, Jamaica. And I, I discovered since this year, but at the time of writing the article, I wasn't too sure how I was connected. A lot of people were on ancestry. Mm-hmm. And I, my first DNA test was on my heritage. So I did a DNA test with ancestry and then was able to access further information and to build a tree and to discover that the duck and feed line actually came through um, my skin line that my because my grandmother had changed her name and disconnected yeah. herself from that family I didn't know anything so yeah. through the duck and feel and the O'Connor and the Skinners um, came my line so Robert Duck and Feel was my sixth great grandfather mm-hmm. and um, and in England his great grandfather his great grandfather was um, Lieutenant Colonel. Robert Duckenfield, where there's a statue of him in the town of Duckenfield in Greater Manchester. Oh. So I so I was able to go through with that. The other issue, too, which I found of interest was it mentioned that my sixth great grandmother, Jane Erickson, was a free nigger woman who he had children with. Okay. And I said, oh, free nigger woman, because the general impression we got with the Jamaican history is, was that everybody who was black were slaves. That's right. You know, and as I did the research and so on, I found that Kingston had the largest population of black people who are not slaves and who are not maroons, right? And, and of course, you know, when it's Black History Month, uh, our media generally, uh, um, show movies or documentary on American, African-American slave stories yes. and their encounter. Very few thing on Jamaican history. So, and of course, Roots with Alex Haley have also um, colored our history. Mm-hmm. So we look at Jamaica's history through the North American experience rather than looking and say what we have here. Exactly. So it is within all of these things that propelled me to write. And of course you realize the article came out around December when we were contemplating what happened with the Sam Sharp rebellion. Yes. And I wanted to write something refreshing and different about what was happening in Jamaica. Thank you so much for that because you mentioned it in a number of um topics right now that you just spoken about in your article that, you know, the greater society is only interested in terms of the national heroes and the acts of emancipation, as if there wasn't another side. Why is this so important to make sure that people are aware of the free Blacks and that they own slaves? Well, it's not even just that. After emancipation, the history between what happened after emancipation to adult suffrage of 1944 is almost missing from our our, 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 um, narrative. I found, for example, that um, in my own family, we we had great teachers, like the Stuarts family out of Spanish town who once owned a a little hotel there. 
and have been also involved in education and stuff like that. Uh, my grand aunt, who was born in 1896 in Harewood, St. Catherine, uh, when she, she uh, completed Harewood Elementary, she did three years working at the school there and did um, bio correspondence teacher training at Michael and then went into Kingston to teach at the Shildo Park Primary School, where she taught for until she died um, in 1979. What, what I'm saying is that there was so much happening out there, but somehow our narrative got stuck on the national heroes and so on, but we don't really know anything else what was happening outside. And therefore, I, I think, um, well, it is important that we as a people should really go beyond those to see what informs them to be separated and to be upheld as heroes. Yes, definitely. I, I definitely agree. And in your article that you gave an example about the Mosquito Indians, and would you provide some details on this as to why the topic, why they're the relevance to this topic? Well, first of all, my late mother had a best friend who resides in Manibon, who's still alive at the moment, is a descendant of the Mosquito Indians out of St. Elizabeth, Jamaica. Okay. And not many of us hear about them. Yes, I think that some of the history books have them, but to really know that um, there are people still in Jamaica walking among us to this very day who are descendants, uh, it's, it's not a popular view. Uh, the information is not really there. And in reading upon about them, I also found that they also fill a gap because somehow in the narrative that is presented to us, without going beyond the headlines, as we would say. Yes. When the British um, captured Jamaica from the Spanish, you got the idea that um, African slavery began at the same time and continued. But the truth is that it wasn't so, that when the British came to Jamaica, that they first traded with the Indians and that they had actually enslaved Indians out of um, South America um, who were um, mosquito. Um, you know, the, which also point to something too, the reality that all tribes in the world at that time uh, in this power game would have enslaved each other. So whether you're Black or Indian or Chinese or what, slavery was a, a way of how they think and view the world. Yes. Right? So yes. finding that here at this time, there were people of mosquito descendants in our midst. I had to go and search. And the thing about it too is that there are Jamaicans who have in their DNA like matches for Indians, but the Indian ancestry predates the coming of in Indians from India. And it was necessarily the Tainos which um, we knew came, were here when uh, Columbus came, yes. but from um, those who were um, descendants of mosquito um, population living here. So that led to, in a sense, include a little of that history and to fill that gap between what happened between um, the British taking over from the Spanish before the Africans were enslaved and brought here. Yes. Oh, my. Thank you for that. Because as well, the discussion uh, basically of free Blacks living in Jamaica is not discussed very often. It's only mentioned when you're, you know, when the person, when somebody is doing their family history, they see it in census because they put it in the population. Um, and, and definitely they're not referred to as any type of slavers during that time either. What can you say? I think, first of all, the idea that there are Blacks who own slaves, you know, it's, um, it's not an acceptable thought, but it's the reality of the, the era. And two, 
I also believe that part of it, because I remember when I did mention it, that some people told me I, I was a liar, that there was no such thing. Yeah. But I think that um, it is because we have our view of our history have been captured by the North American lens, right? Definitely. Yeah. So if it ha- if it didn't happen in America a certain way, it couldn't happen in Jamaica. And I have seen that because in 2019, December of 2019, I remember going to, going to a debate academy and the presenter was a African-American professor who, you know, he was going to talk about human rights and he began with an emotive hook t- talking about the American independence of 1865. And then when he turned to Jamaica, he turned, he started to speak about the Paul Boger rebellion, but I discovered that he placed it in the period of slavery rather than after emancipation. Mm. And I had to find a way how to correct him without embarrassing him because there were young people there who were going to write history papers and I didn't want them to go and put this wrong answer. So I began by sharing my knowledge of American history and its own emancipation. And then I went to the story of Samsha and pointed out that that was one of the last major assaults before emancipation of 1834. So by the time I mentioned that then, everybody was able to see where the Moran Bay Rebellion um, had its place in history without embarrassing um, each other at that time, you know? And I remember at the end, he came and he shook my hand and said, boy, he really appreciated the way I approached it. But yes, we have been captured through the North American lens. We see our history through American lens. And because of that, we fail to see what was unique about our own story and even try to understand what was happening here as a people. So Definitely. when you go across Jamaica, even Blacks marrying white people uh, occurred during slavery, which could never happen elsewhere. So there must be something here about our history that, is, that we now need to confront. And in confronting it, I think it helped to strengthen our own identity of who we are as a people. Definitely, the white slave owner who wanted to pass down, you know, their legacies to their offsprings, but were unable to because they couldn't inherit uh, due to the laws from 1761, where the Jamaican government prohibited the free blacks from purchasing land in excess of 2,000 pounds Jamaican currency and from inheriting property beyond that amount. So this required the usually the white slave owner to then make their mixed race offspring legally white through private act in parliament. What can you say about that? Okay, um, it's important. Our, I, I found it very interesting that you had recognized um, this in, in the Jamaican history. And I think that we need to understand in a particular context. The restrictions by the Jamaican Assembly in 1761 occurred just after the Prince Taki revolt of 1760. This revolt was one of the first during a period between 1750 and the 1800 that is dubbed the age of revolution as the then world was turned upside down. Mm -hmm. Beginning with the aborted 1760, uh, Prince Taki war in Jamaica. 16 years later, it was the American War of Independence, 1776. And of course, we also have in 1782, um, Emperor um, Tupac in South South America, who also tried to um, free his nation from the Spanish rule. And then later on, you had the French Revolution, uh, which culminated with the Haitian Revolution. So all of that period where um, non-whites 
and people who thought that the colonial powers were overbearing were seeking freedom. Yeah. So here in Jamaica, remember that democracy was defined by land ownership. So the first thing they had to do was to restrict the blacks and how much acres of land they could own because the blacks outnumbered them and therefore it meant that they could then gain political power. Yes. Right? And that further now made the white people saw these private acts to ensure that their children would get um, certain amount even beyond the restriction of the regular blacks. Yes. Right. But there was the fear of blacks having political power that was underpinning everything. So we have to, 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 to remember that these were the things that influenced all of that. And of course, 2000 pounds um, at that time was a lot of money too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. You know, but that, that, that was the root of um, these restrictions. The Prince Tucker revolt, which was one of the greatest on, onslaught on the Jamaican assembly and, and, and so forth. And of course, as I pointed out, there was a chain of other um, rebellions taking place across the region and so on. But the greatest fear was political power for Black people. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And as well, in the article, you mentioned that the names that were used to describe some of the offspring from these white slave owners and referencing the meanings of these names. Can you just expand on that a little bit? Okay. All right. We now live in a time now where we speak about mixed race and um, for the African Americans, Americans, they had gone through an evolution of names from Negroes to Blacks to African American and so on. Yes. Uh, in Jamaica and, and I guess in other parts of the Caribbean and so on, they had different degrees of either how, how much white you have. Mm -hmm. So you had mulattoes who were one half black and one half white. Yes. And then you had sambos who were black and mulatto, you know, um, three fourths black and one fourth white. You had quadrons and you had mestis. So you had all these different little combos um, as, as against being fully African and fully white at the, the left and at the right. Yes. So in between. So the, the mulattoes um, would have been the offspring of the white man or the white woman and, and of the, the African mm -hmm. and, and all of that. But since then, no, well, Jamaica still have a little culture where they talk about browning and all of that. So somewhere in the back of our um, subconsciousness, yes, they, they still have that little battle, but it's coming all the way back from there. Perfect. Thank you for that. And, and as well, you go into the details in your article about your own family history, which is very interesting and very process, very, you know, very interesting in terms of the whole process of everything. And why is it so important? That, that too, um, as I said, one, uh, to discover that the time where in my own family, uh, my heritage, I call it that, whether it, it came out of slavery or not, um, but who, all of it made me who I am. Yes. And, and even before I, I go there, let me just explain something that a lot of people forget. Uh, yes. Just over the last five days, I had a DNA match out of London. It was a, a young, well, he is 61 years old. Mm -hmm. He was born in 1960 and was given up for adoption at that point. Oh, wow. Um, since then, he did his DNA and had been searching for his family, and apparently he matches me. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to our own correspondence, he, contact, he got in touch with his birth mother, who mm -hmm. is now 81 years old and lives in California, and who had since been a family. And um, the only thing he knew was that his grandfather was a senior officer of the Jamaica Defense, of the Jamaica Police Force here. And through my investigations, I was able to find um, 
one of his aunt mm -hmm. spoke to her and yes she knew of that baby that was given up for adoption and i was able to um get them to communicate and share with each other and of course because he matches me then i then also discovered something else about my family mm -hmm. because um his grandfather is is also uh, um, connected to my mother's side of the family wow right i am hoping maybe by the end of the week to work out how <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. but um but um my cousin's aunt who is also my cousin said yes um, her father is related to my side of the family she's going to send me in detail and so on but it goes to show that dna doesn't lie and yes. that um, people go in search about their families, to know about their families, because, you know, it's part of, you know, who are you? Yes. So um, in this article, when I discovered, for example, not just about Robert Duck and Field, but as I pointed out, I, I found that my connection was through the line that my grandmother had the family and and further since then i discovered that um on both sides of my family we are a political family mm. so i have relatives who have been a prime minister in jamaica or a member of parliament on both sides and uh, i've i found cousins in trinidad and haiti i have chinese cousins all about and so on so this story, you know, was like something new and refreshing. And of course, to find that, okay, there was a, a free Negro woman who in 1755 was given land, slaves and money, which was some 70 odd years before emancipation in Jamaica. And of course, the old narrative was that, you know, all blacks were enslaved. So we had to face that reality Yes, um, slavery is not something that we celebrate, mm -hmm. but I also discovered that in understanding history, you cannot use our uh, 21st century understanding of the subject. You have to go back into the minds of how the people saw the world back then in yes. order to appreciate and then know how you will not make certain mistakes. Exactly. So, so all of that propelled me to share my story. And yes, um, in the article I had mentioned that Robert was my 13th great-grandfather. At the time in writing, I didn't understand the degrees and, and so forth. But having done the second DNA match on, um, with Ancestry and actually finding all the links, I, I was able to properly classify and, and so forth. And with that one, um, I had received an official letter declaring that I'm the first black, the first person of African descent to DNA prove that I'm a duck and field descendant. Wow. But just to create a bar, my white ancestry over my African ancestry, I also wish to share that um, I am Nigerian, both Igbo and Yoruba. I have found my cousins um, in those categories. And one is also a famous musician, um, currently residing in Germany, but have been playing all over the world, mm -hmm. right? And on my mother's side, whose uh, second great grandfather was from Ghana, he died here in Jamaica in 1908 at 111 years old. He was born in 1791 mm -hmm. and his grave I can still find it. It is on the family land nearby where we currently live. So I, in a sense, know of my African heritage with the exception of my Kenyan roots because I have DNA uh, from Kenya and I'm trying to figure out, I've, I've found cousins who are with it, but you know, here I am in Jamaica and you say, mm -hmm. oh my God, how, how Kenya come up like that? Yes. And Here's another one. Um, I have cousins from Afghanistan. 
And I mean, when you look at them, you know, you see how the, the Afghans <laughs> look. And then when you put me beside you, you say, how the heck you two are related, but then they don't lie. Yes. Right. Yes. So with that and the, that difference and to face the reality of who I am, I wrote the story. We, we cannot continue to hide and, and to create a narrative that doesn't exist. We need to deal with the truth of who we are as a people and then in understanding who we are to chart a, a way forward. Definitely, because you're definitely, what you just described is you're definitely connected. We're all connected in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. And so then what is your then call to action for for all Jamaican history to be taught without the exclusion of this vital information? The first thing I discovered that a lot of our histories are stored in universities overseas. Yes. In, in England and, uh, and so forth. The other thing I, I find too is that if you're doing the research, a lot of information you sometimes need, you have to pay for. Yep. Because um, they are either with some site that requires for you to pay. And I guess that because of that, many of our history books uh, haven't been updated because we just keep repeating what was there because it costs, you know, to, yes. to, to get the information. So it speaks to the role of the, I would say the National Library of Jamaica and perhaps the Institute of Jamaica in how are they um, involved with repatriating our history, yes. things about Jamaica. Uh, for example, I have a friend who just completed his master's in psychology, which had him, uh, he did with an overseas university in England. And because he had access to their library, he was able to find, for example, a list with um, Jamaican Maroons who owned slaves, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and he found other things about Jamaican history, which is not here. So it is important for us to repatriate our history, to get those information, work out something between our libraries and these national libraries in other countries so that our people can have access to who we are rather than just sticking to an oral account where when you put it on the scientific examination, you cannot stand. Definitely. I would definitely agree with you because I know when I was uh, researching my family history, I definitely accessed a lot of uh, things out of England and, of course, out of the United States. And when I did visit the libraries in Jamaica, they didn't have access to some of that information. So um, as we close out, is there any other um, items that you wanted to, to speak to? Recently, there was discussions about whether, um, for example, of course, there was a misunderstanding about DNA and if the Maroons were an ethnic group versus regular Jamaicans. And therefore, if they did a DNA test, they would show as a different ethnicity. But the Jamaican motto speaks to out of many one people. And I think that the, our Ministry of Culture should seek some sort of funding to do a sample of our people across. We have certain unique groups across Jamaica. There is a group over in St. Mary, for example, who are descendants of Spanish speaking, um, uh, I don't remember if it's Africans or whatever, but Right across Jamaica, you, you have these unique groups that you can also do their DNA tests and create a national, what I would have called a national support of our motto out of many one people. Yes. Because, the, because the truth is that, you know, you would look at me and say, oh, you know, he's a black guy. And then what, nine ethnicities? And I found that there, I found people who had 13. So mm -hmm. we really mix up. <laughs> yeah. But but I, I think it, it could strengthen our identity to realize that we also have different cultures because yes. there are 14 parishes, there will be 15 soon, but every parish have a different culture. 
And even within the parishes, uh, depending on where you, are, you, you, you grew up and where you live, there is a different culture. My mother's side, my grandfather's home to this very day, although he died in 1957. And my, here's the thing, my step-grandmother, who I also discovered through DNA, was also my cousin. Mm -hmm. um, at that home, we take off our shoes to enter the house. But my mother had um, brought me up where I could walk into the, our own house without the shoes. But whenever we get to this house, to this very day, we take off our shoes and go in. Just to point out that every home has that unique culture and we need to start to understand these uniqueness and so on. So we need to start to document it. So one, as I mentioned, repatriate our history from overseas and to try to understand who we are across our parishes and all of that. Even uh, part of Jamaican values, I found a 2010 article by uh, Professor Alexander Powell from UAE, where it was identified that while in many other countries, for example, the United States, individualism is a more dominant feature of that country, as against say Japan and China, where that is a collective, Jamaica keeps intention both. Mm -hmm. So if we start to recognize this tension we have between being a collective society or an individualistic society, we can form um, actionable policies to um, abate and solve our problem because both have to be held in, 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 in a compromise for the development of our people. So the idea of doing something mandatory versus um, those who wish to, to challenge things done mandatory is rooted in, the, in who we are as a people. Yes. And therefore, it is best to come to a compromise because it is one of the values we, we hold dearly. Thank you so much for that. And I really do want to thank you, Darlie, for coming on to the podcast and discussing your article that you wrote in regards to the free Blacks that uh, had owned slaves and being able to put this out there so others can be aware and, and for that knowledge. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please make sure to like, follow, subscribe, and write a review for the episode wherever you listen to your podcast. Thank you.